最前沿的科学研究。Good morning, Shen. Good morning, Betty. How are you doing? I'm pretty good.、Uh, still stuck at home. Yeah, we've been at home for almost two months here in Massachusetts and recording our episode with all these amazing guests that we had over the last two months. We have a lot of good news to share with the listeners today, Shen. Right? Yeah, absolutely. We're really excited. So we are on the top 100. Chart of a life sciences podcast on Apple Podcasts, so we're really excited about that. We would like to thank our wonderful team on Science Rehash, as well as we would like to thank our audience and listeners for supporting us through these past few months, especially during this pandemic. Yeah, and we have a lot of. Nice and exciting things for the upcoming episode. One of them is as the country starts reopening and getting back to business, we have a follow-up episode for the COVID nineteen that we're gonna update about the current state of the COVID nineteen, the progress for the vaccine. As well as we have a lot of exciting research coming on, but today we have a very special guest. Meet the legend with Dr. Rudy Tanzi. Yes, Dr. Rudy Tanzi. He is really a man who needs no introduction. Not only he is he a world-renowned scientist in the field of Alzheimer's disease, he's also an international best-selling author. You might recognize him on Time Magazine's 100 Most Influential People in the World, or you know, casually jamming alongside legendary Joe Perry from Aerosmith. In fact, our music in our introduction is from Rudy's own creation. It's the piece called Nitrogen. He has his own website on numberonemusic.com, and here you can find a number of pieces that he has written, performed, and recorded over a million plays. So, a very popular musician. Yeah, and we've been very lucky to have Dr. Tenzi as our mentor and been working with him over the last few years in neuroscience and specifically in Alzheimer's disease. And I cannot be more grateful to have a, such a thoughtful person in my career and in my life. Uh, uh, so I can't wait to have this discussion with Dr. Rudy Tenzi. Well, welcome, Dr. Tenzi, to our podcast. We would like to start off with you introducing yourself. Well, I'm Rudy Tanzi, and I'm a professor of neurology at Harvard Medical School. I hold the Joseph P. and Rose F. Kennedy Chair, and at Mass General, I have numerous titles: Vice Chair of Department of Neurology, Director of the Genetics and Aging Research Unit, Co-Director of the McCann Center for Brain Health, and Co-Director of the Mass General Institute for Neurodegenerative Disease. You were born in Providence, Rhode Island. Growing up there, were you always a curious child? Well, my father was. A bread baker, and he came from a long line of bread bakers. And I, I broke the bread baking lineage. And my mom, she was a, a nurse and a medical transcriptionist, so I was exposed to medicine all the time and really good bread all the time. And、uh, my mom and dad started one of the first out-serviced medical transcription services in the country way back in the '60s. I used to work for them, so I used to read their reports. My job was to count. The number of lines in the reports, and then multiply it by whatever cents, and that's how much they charge Mass General and different hospitals for transcribing the medical reports. But it gave me a, a lot of exposure to medicine, and I would read these, and I think that more than anything got me interested in medicine. So I, I wasn't a great employee for my mom and dad because I spent way too much time reading rather than just counting the lines and getting through them. So when you started out your journey in science, you received a BS. In microbiology, and then you moved from Rochester to Harvard for a PhD. I got a BA in history as well. So, what made you focus your research in neurology and specifically in Alzheimer's disease? So, the microbiology BS was actually a new program they had then at University of Rochester, where undergraduates could take graduate level courses. So, I took probably six graduate level courses for. Doctoral students, while I was an undergrad, so the professors I had all became very famous people, like Pippa Marek in immunology and Fred Sherman in microbiology. And at that time, the genetic engineering revolution, as we called it back then, was going on. And I got to work in labs where, like, I, I think I did the first BAMH1 
digest in the world because the person I worked with had discovered BAMH1. So I became very interested in recombinant DNA and what was then called genetic engineering work. And I was using it, I was mapping genes in bacteria. I was mapping through recombination analysis the genes that make vitamin K and B subtilis. So when I graduated and I was mainly playing in a band, making money five nights a week after graduation, and I said, boy, I got to get a real job. And we were playing at the Holiday Inn across the street from Mass General. And I remember going to Mass General all the time with my dad when we would deliver the medical transcription work that we did. I went in and there was an ad back then, this was 1980. It was just a written out ad and a bulletin board for someone to do recombinant DNA, genetic mapping, et cetera, southern blots. And I said, oh, I know how to do all that. And it was very new technology at the time. Jim Gasella at the time, I think he was only 25 at the time. I was about 20. And he was looking for a postdoc. And frankly, I didn't even know what a postdoc was. So I'm like, I can do that. So HR uh, got me the interview. And I told Jim, I said, I I did all this stuff. And he took a chance and hired me. So what kind of projects did you do with Jim? Well, you know, we were the first ones to try to find genetic markers to find a disease gene. I mean, it's so obvious now, but at the time, a scientist named David Brodstein had suggested that you could find variations in the human genome using restriction enzymes. So variations that destroy or create restriction enzyme sites in DNA. So these were the first SNPs. They were called RIFLIPs, Restriction Fragment Length Polymorphisms. And at the time we started, there was one in the world, a chromosome 14 that Ray White had. And we found the next dozen or so randomly. So the picture, you got 3 billion bases of DNA, and we found you know, a dozen individual bases where there was variation. And then said, okay, now let's try to find linkage to the Huntington's disease gene, having no idea what the gene was or what caused Huntington's disease. And then we not only found one, but actually I picked out two different SNPs linked to Huntington's out of the first random dozen we picked out. And the odds of that when you calculate it are probably anywhere from 20,000 to 50,000 to one to find linkage to that disease so fast. So it was extremely lucky. But that was the first time a disease gene was found by genetics. And that was 1986? No, that was 1980 to 82. We published it in 1983 in Nature. Okay. And that study, Jim Costello was first author, Joe Martin, the ex-dean of Harvard Medical School, who was then at that time chair of neurology at Mass General, um, was the last author. And, you know, I was tucked in the middle. So I was the hands, you know, I did the work at the bench. That study really prompted the Human Genome Project. We said, wow, you could just have no idea what causes a disease have no idea what the gene is, and then just do genetic linkage and localize the gene, and now you know what causes the disease. And this sounds so mundane now, but back then it was like mind-blowing. You could solve a complete mystery by just looking for genetic linkage with a disease. And Jim and I were the first ones to do it. So I nominate him for the Nobel Prize. Every time the Nobel Committee asks me for a nomination, I nominate Jim and say, hey, this guy started it all. He, he was the first one. It was the first time a disease gene was ever found by genetics. And then I was going to go to get, get a PhD in genetics, not neuroscience. So this is how I got to neuroscience. And I wanted to, to be the first to build an end-to-end map of a chromosome. So I picked chromosome 21. Can you guess why? Why? Well, it's the smallest chromosome there is. And I was going to be in it, and I wanted to get done fast. And then chromosome 21 got me into Down syndrome because in Down syndrome, you have a triplicated 21 trisomy. Now, back then, before the Human Genome Project, I became the chromosome 21 guy. I was a young kid. I think at the time I was still playing in a rock band. But now people come to me to try to map features of Down syndrome on the map. And then I read a News and Views by Gene Marks, and it said that Down syndrome subjects get Alzheimer's pathology inevitably by middle age. I said, you know what, maybe I want to do that. Maybe instead of just building the map, maybe I want to study Alzheimer's disease and I have the map to do it. So I switched everything. I had been accepted to Yale in the human genetics program, which was the best one in the country. And then the last minute I turned it down. I didn't go. I think I even had to return a stipend check. And I said, no, I'm going to apply for neuroscience. I was so naive that when I turned down Yale, I only applied to Harvard neuroscience program. I didn't apply to anywhere else. But luckily, got in. And then for my thesis, I said, I wildly speculated 
there'd be an Alzheimer's gene. It would be on chromosome 21. And it was the gene that was going to be making the plaques in Alzheimer's. Of course, the heads of the neurobiology department, where I was getting my PhD, said, this is like crazy wild speculation. You're a grad student. It's way too high risk. You should do something else. I said, no, <laughs> I'm going to do it. And then it worked out. In summer of 86, I isolated the gene that makes amyloid. I named it amyloid beta protein precursor, APP. I mapped the chromosome 21. It explained Down syndrome. And next thing you know, as a student between 87 and 88, I had seven papers in nature and science, four first author, three second author. Crazy days. And that launched the I never, never looked back. And my grandmother got Alzheimer's disease after I started studying Alzheimer's. So that was kind of weird to experience it in the family after I started studying it. It has been over three decades since 1986 and 1987 where you had thou speak papers on APP published in a big journal. What do you think we have learned over the last three decades in the AD field? And what are the biggest advancements? Look, what have we learned? We've learned amyloid matters, amyloid causes the disease, but it does it decades before symptoms, two decades. So by the time someone has Alzheimer's disease, if you treat just amyloid, it's like someone with congestive heart failure who just had a heart attack and you say, yeah, just take some Lipitor, take a statin. You have to lower cholesterol decades before to prevent heart disease. We have to lower amyloid decades before to prevent Alzheimer's. You can't take a full-blown patient with dementia and expect us to hit amyloid and help them. I know Biogen's betting on that with map, which, by the way, was, it was inspired by our lab, by Rob Moyer's work. And amyloid's a great target, but only for secondary prevention. The future will be for like my 12-year-old daughter. Someday she'll get a, a blood test that says where she is on the amyloid scale in her brain. And then she'll be advised as to whether she has to stop bringing her amyloid levels down, just like cholesterol and heart disease. But for now, what we've learned for helping patients is that what's killing the most neurons in an actively demented patient, it's neuroinflammation. Plaques of the match comes early, tangles to the brush fires. You have to hit those early, that's secondary prevention. Smokey the bear, only you can prevent forest fires. The forest fires, the neuroinflammation, that's what's burning in the brain. That's what's causing the dementia. You can't expect to blow out the match or stamp out the brush fires when the forest fire is already raging. So that's why neuroinflammation is the target. And to finish this, we had no idea what caused neuroinflammation in Alzheimer's other than cell types. But then our lab in 2008 discovered the first neuroinflammation Alzheimer's gene, CD33. And then later, TREM2 was found at Decode Genetics. And now we know CD33 are the on and off switches for activating microglial neuroinflammation. And so we target those and other ways to try to stop neuroinflammation. We're going to have a lot more luck helping patients hitting neuroinflammation. We already have a successful trial that indicates that. As you explained, people suffering from Alzheimer's develop a buildup of two main proteins that impair communications between nerve cells in the brain. One of the key ones is the plaques made of amyloid beta proteins. And the second one is the neurofibrillary tangles made of tau proteins. However, we know that not all people with those signs of Alzheimer's show cognitive decline during their lifetime. Then the question becomes, what sets these people apart from those with the same amyloid plaques and tangles that develop the signature dementia? Well, it turns out that it's not common, but people can die with tons of plaques and tangles and not have Alzheimer's. There are so-called resilient brains. More often, you see people die with lots of plaques and no Alzheimer's, but you see plenty of times people dying with no dementia, they're in their 80s, and they have lots of plaques and tangles. And these are called resilient brains. And Dr. Teresa Gomez Isla at Mass General has really championed the study of these resilient brains. She has probably the largest collection of brains where there's plaques and tangles and no dementia when they die. And the answer is always the same about what makes them resilient. No neuroinflammation, no activated microglia, no astrogliosis. So this is good news. It means you can have the match, the plaques, you can have the brush fires, the tangles, but if that doesn't start a forest fire, neuroinflammation, you don't get the disease. And that's why I think it's, it gives us a lot of hope that if we can just stop plaques and tangles 
And the cell death they cause, which is small, from triggering in the innate immune system in this evolutionary program that still haunts us to trigger neuroinflammation when neurons die. And remember that neuroinflammatory program was evolutionarily conserved because 30,000 years ago, if neurons were dying in your brain and lifespan was 25 years old, it wasn't Alzheimer's. You had some infectious encephalitis or meningitis. So the innate immune system of the brain and these microglial cells that are normally cleaning up sense that neurons are dying. That's, and they do that because they're eating debris and they eat membranes of neurons and go, whoa, neurons are dying. You trigger neuroinflammation and neuroinflammation wipes that area of the brain out because it's compromised. It might be infected. Some people are lucky enough, probably genetically, maybe a little bit of lifestyle. They're not triggering neuroinflammation as robustly in the presence of plaques and tangles as others. They are resilient. And this gives us the best clue about having to treat neuroinflammation, either by protecting neurons against it or by stopping the activation of neuroinflammation. I'm involved with two companies, one doing each. And one company that went after neuroprotection just had a successful ALS trial. The paper should be coming out in New England Journal of Medicine soon. And they're looking at approval. And here's the thing. If you hit neuroinflammation and ALS, it's going to work on Alzheimer's and Parkinson's and Huntington's. It's all the same. Whatever the neurodegenerative disease, the initiating pathology determines which neurons will die in which brain region and will determine ultimately which neuronal function is affected, memory or movement. So Lewy bodies are the match for Parkinson's, inclusions in ALS, plaques and tangles in Alzheimer's. But in each case, until enough neurons die in that brain region to trigger neuroinflammation, you probably are not going to get symptoms. So any therapy you have that either protects against neuroinflammation, like Amelix or AZ Therapies, another company that uh, I'm involved with, but AZ Therapies is trying to stop microglial activation into neuroinflammation. So I think you're going to need a combination. Take out the killers, meaning stop neuroinflammation, and provide the bulletproof vest, meaning protect the neurons at the same time. That's what Amelix and AZ Therapies are doing. And to be honest, there aren't that many companies doing it yet. It's still relatively new to it to hit neuroinflammation. Can you also comment about the Biogen drug and where you see that going and how that fits into Alzheimer's as a whole? We're waiting to hear if Biogen's antibody, aducanumab, will be approved. Bottom line is it, it targets amyloid, and they gambled that if they hit the earliest, mildest possible patients, it may still be early enough to stop that forest fire. It might be early enough to try to blow up the match. I predicted that the trial wouldn't work. I thought it's just too late. And a patient is already suffering from even mild dementia. It's too late. But what they did was clever. So what they did begins with the work of our late colleague, Rob Moyer. Rob found autoantibodies to amyloid beta oligomers and showed that these antibodies were protective against Alzheimer's. There's a paper we published in JBC 2005. And the more these autoantibodies you had, the more protection you had against Alzheimer's. So we didn't follow up on it therapeutically, but Roger Nietzsche and Christoph Hoch in Switzerland started a company called Neuromir. And they took that paper and they would go to talks and show our paper and say, we're going after these autoantibodies that Moyer and Tansy described because this we think would be the best immunotherapy. And in fact, the last line of our paper was, if you're making an immunotherapy against amyloid, mimic these antibodies, they're the natural ones to protect you. And that's what Roger and Christoph did. And so I wanted to work more than anybody because, you know, we, we inspired it. And Roger Nietzsche, Biogen doesn't admit this, but whenever Roger Nietzsche gives his talk, first slide he shows is our paper and a highlighted quote at the end about mimicking these antibodies for immunotherapy. But the thing is that I, I still, you know, they had one phase three trial that failed and one phase three trial that was almost identical that worked. So will the FDA approve it? I think the FDA will approve it because it's an unmet medical need and they, they got benefit. But I don't think it will be commercially successful because I think even though the FDA approves it, I think CMA will say, wait a minute, how, how are we going to pay over 100000 a year per patient? You've got to have a, a, a PET scan first to see if you have enough amyloid. And then you have to have an IgG infusion once or twice a month. And even if they work out doing it at home, it's going to be a $10,000 a month drug, maybe, maybe as little as 5000 probably 10000 And then you have to have an MRI every now and then to make sure you don't have 
vasogenic edema or hemorrhage or aria, as it's called. So you're talking about a price tag per patient of 100 to 150,000 per year. Well, who's going to get it? And how do you decide who gets it? I think CMA is going to say, you know what? This opens the door for amyloid. It shows that amyloids may be a good target for early mild to some extent, but we're going to wait for the little white pill that is safe and economically feasible. And that's why in our lab, we've been working for 20 years on gamma secretase modulators, because right now, that's the last little white pill standing that may be able to safely lower amyloid with an oral formulation that's not so cumbersome and expensive as an antibody. So that's our, our path. You have often used the term shield model to talk about what people can do when they are thinking about the likelihood of reducing the risk of Alzheimer's disease. Could you talk a little bit about what are the components of the shield model? I wrote three books with Deepak Chopra, self-help books about how to live a life that takes advantage of the incredible neuroplasticity of the brain. That was super brain. Then I wrote super genes about how to live your life in a way that fosters good epigenetics and, and programming, diet, exercise, etc. But putting the science behind why this is a good idea. And then we decided to get into inflammation especially chronic stress causing chronic inflammation. And that was The Healing Self, our last book, The Healing Self. And we wrote about psychoneuroimmunology, about how the mind has such an amazing effect on your immune status and on inflammation. We collected the evidence for that. And then at the end, we had a seven-day action plan for how to live your life to best increase the odds of lowering your chronic level of inflammation. Now, mind you, we were careful to say there are no trials on this. There are no guarantees. These are just recommendations. And the thing is, most people don't do trials on this stuff. So at the time the book was coming out in January 2018, I had just finished doing a new album as a musician with Joe Perry and Johnny Depp at Johnny Depp's house and a bunch of other musicians, Ringo Starr's son, Zach Starkey. And the album was coming out the same week as the book. And so that meant there were things to do for the album, like a release tour, but there was also things to do with the book, like book talks. So I had to quickly figure out a way how to encapsulate the seven-day action plan at the end. And I was in the shower, and I keep a, a pad in the shower called Aquanote. So I wrote, I came up with this idea, shield, shield your brain. So S was for sleep, sleeping long enough getting enough hours of sleep, preferably eight hours, even if it's not continuous, to go in and out of REM because during deep sleep is when your lymphatic system, your lymphatic system, your glia clean your brain. And H was for handling stress, meaning that chronic stress is clearly associated with chronic inflammation. So meditation practice. And you know Deepak and Elizabeth Blackburn, the Nobel laureate who discovered telomerase, and Eric Schott, the famous genomicist, we had a paper not long before the book that showed the effects of meditation on RNA-seq transcriptomics. We saw a 40% increase in telomerase activity. This was a, a controlled meditation trial that we had done, and the paper was published in a nature journal called Translational Psychiatry. I, interaction, social interaction. Loneliness is a risk factor for Alzheimer's. Not being alone, but being alone and not liking it, or stressfully being alone. You know, right now with covid and social distancing, I like to remind people, it's not, we're not socially distancing, we're physically distancing. But loneliness increases risk for Alzheimer's by meta-analysis by twofold. E is exercise. As you know, exercise induces neurogenesis in the brain, the great work of Sei Hung Choi in our unit. In science, exercise has been shown to help clear amyloid by inducing neprilysin, an amyloid degradation enzyme. Exercise helps reduce inflammation. L is learn new things. So in the end of the day, Alzheimer's Dementia correlates with loss of synapses. So the more synapses you have, the more you can lose before you lose it. So you spend every day trying to make new synapses. And since learning is based on association, when you make new synapses, you reinforce pathways to form a synapses. So I always say, if you're learning something new right now, I'm helping you. If I'm putting you to sleep, I'm still helping you. So for the people that are listening to us right now, there are new synapses built up, right? That's right. We're building up synaptic reserve. And that's thanks to the brain plasticity, right? Yes, exactly. So diet, and of course we have work in our unit going on about the microbiome. So any diet that helps your gut microbiome and reduces the odds of cardiovascular disease and stroke is a good diet. And the best diet for that is Mediterranean diet. 
because it's very high in fruit, fiber, seeds, nuts that are prebiotics to help your gut bacteria. It's less red meat. I'm a vegetarian. It's more fish. I don't eat fish just because I like fish. So anything that helps gut microbiome, we know that will help reduce neuroinflammation, even reduce plaques in the brain. And, and by the way, if you, if you really think that people are meant to be carnivores, you should consider that we have grinders in our mouth, not gnashers. We don't have big fangs. And secondly, the pH of our stomach cannot handle raw meat. We would die. But true carnivores have an acidic pH that instantly kills the bacteria on the raw meat that they're gnashing with their fangs that we don't have. And third, our GI tract winds around and curls, meant for grains and breaking them down. It's not meant for meat, which putrefies in a winding colon. And a true carnivore has a more straight line GI so that the meat doesn't sit around too long, especially since it could be full of bacteria. You have been very active in the cost talk of gut microbiome and the brain health. Is the goal to let the gut microbiome to take care of the brain health or is it a two-way street? You know, we see in Alzheimer's mice that as the Alzheimer's mice get older and sicker, the gut microbiome undergoes dysbiosis. You fix that dysbiosis with a symbiotic, meaning replace the probiotic bacteria that are missing, add fructooligosaccharide as a prebiotic. Otherwise, you would get that from fiber and plants, and then the mice improve. So a sick brain can make the gut sick, and a sick gut can make the brain sick. So it's a two-way street. I actually started a company with Gary Rovkin, who discovered microRNAs and is on the short list for the Nobel Prize for that. It's called Marvel Biome. And what, what we're doing there is we're using C. elegans models of disease, oxidative stress, energy metabolism. Then you feed each C. elegans worm individual strains of probiotic bacteria to see which ones fix them. So now you have the exact strain of bacteria that works. Then you mutagenize the bacteria to find out which gene actually was responsible. So you can even provide not just that one bacteria, but you can also add back the protein that the mutagenized gene taught you was responsible for the benefit. So that's a new company where we're taking the microbiome to a new level. It's down to the individual strains of probiotic bacteria and the genes and proteins that might be responsible for providing protection against inflammation and oxidative stress and energy metabolism deficits in the brain. Before we end, I want to talk about the inspiration you get from music and how your music and science can really work together to make better music and also better science. You know, science is, is just as much creativity as it is logic, right? I mean, the, the best scientists are able to dream big, have big visions, and then take that into the lab and try to bash the hypothesis into the ground and see if it stands up. So you, you balance crazy, ad absurdum visions and innovative thoughts with hardcore, rigorous science that tries to disprove what you think. That's how you get to the truth, but also can discover you know, things that will matter 50, 100 years from now. That creative process is really prone to the rule of success breeds success. Whatever you do in your life that's artistic, that you feel successful, like dancing, like you do dancing, Shen, right? You know, you have a really good night dancing, you did something new, that feeling of creative success breeds more creative success in other things you do like science. So do any way you can be creative will flow over into the science you do. I have found in my career that if I am not playing piano every day, my science fails. How I think about science, innovation, everything, just goes downhill. And I'm also not happy. So music is just a necessary part of my life. And I still release my music, my own music all the time. I have a, a music website that my, my original stuff is. And I still do jam sessions with Joe Perry and Richie Sambora from Bon Jovi and other guys from Aerosmith. I, on my own, I mainly, I mainly play jazz piano. I like doing new improvisations on old jazz standards. And I record a lot of those. And since they're copyrighted, I can't put the jazz standards on my website. It has to be original stuff. So I just record those and just send those out to friends and family who, who might like Bill Evans or Miles Davis or Thelonious Monk or whatever else I'm playing that day. But every day, music every day. And as the last question of today's conversation, I would like to switch gears and talk about a special day in your life. You mentioned in a news report that your life's been very different since 9-11 and it changed your outlook not only for science but also for life. Would you share with us the backstory of this specific day in your life? Well, it's a, it's a long convoluted story about how I did not get on 
the 9-11 flight that hit the second World Trade Tower. But it did involve Susanna, our admin, and involved a waiter who gave me too much to drink. It involved Dennis Selko and Brad Hyman, who scheduled a meeting suddenly on 9-11 that I wasn't supposed to miss. Uh, it involved Steve Martin, the actor-comedian, because I was at his Boston Film Festival party where I did drink too much. It involved Ray Marino, the M of EMC Squared Company, because he's the one who made me drink a lot when he found out that I was the son of Rudolph Tanzi, the Italian bread baker who, who we used to buy bread from. There were a lot of things that happened that finally led to when that alarm clock went off in the morning at 6 a.m., I wasn't getting out of bed because I felt really bad because I had too much to drink. Luckily, Susanna had me on the second flight in the afternoon as a backup because there was a meeting with Brad and Dennis that, that morning, get, just in case I didn't want to miss the program project meeting. So anyway, it kept me off the flight. The following Saturday, I was down where I am right now at my beach house thinking, man, like this is bonus time. This is like playing a pinball machine and the game should be over and you get an extra ball or so. And so I started thinking, what am I not doing in my life that I always wanted to do? And the list included having a kid. Now it is Lila. She's 12. Uh, it included writing books. Now I wrote since then four books, Decoding Darkness, Super Brain, Super Genes, The Healing Self. And it included music. As soon as I met Joe Perry as part of the Rock Stars of Science program, I said, if I have one chance to play with him, he's going to want me to play. So I got my one chance to play with him. He liked how I played. Two weeks after, just, yeah, let's do the, sci the scientists a favor, let him jam with us. And then he liked it. And he said, hey, you got to come and play this song with us on Jay Leno Tonight Show. And I've been basically Joe Perry's keyboard player for his work with Aerosmith and solo stuff now for over 10 years. So I think what I learned after 9-11 is if an opportunity strikes, carpe diem, seize the moment. Don't say, nah, I don't have time for that. Nah, I don't have time for a kid. Uh, I don't have time to write books. I don't have time to do music again. Every opportunity that's come up, I said, yes, even the New England Patriots, right? I watch football, but I always feel bad about them getting hit in the head, risk for CTE later on, chronic traumatic encephalopathy. So when I met Bill Belichick, because he was on the board of a company that I work with on neuroinflammation, AZ Therapies, you know, when Bill said, hey, you know, I, this was an interesting conversation. Maybe you should come and talk to the, the team about it. I said, yes. And now I've been Bill Belichick's brain health advisor at the team. I have two Super Bowl rings. So it just taught me, don't be lazy. Don't be scared. Don't have limited belief systems. Go for it. If there's something you can do that you always want to do and there's a chance to do it, don't sit back. I think that's what surviving 9-11 taught me. Okay, with that, thank you so much for joining us today and I'm looking forward to everything. Thank you, Rudy. Thank you for having me. Our show is available through Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and Google Podcasts. Please subscribe and refer our podcast to your friends. We would love to hear your comments and feedback for our show, so don't hesitate to reach out to us via our website. This episode was the result of incredible teamwork during this hectic time by our wonderful team members, including our writers, Madura Lolikar, Dr. Shuang Zeng, Rhea Taylor, and our marketing director, Dr. Carla Diavanzo, our editors, Tavi Pollard and Sophia Nastri, our assistant, Rebecca Solison, and of course, our creative director, Emma Brand. <laughs>